Who wants to learn about graphs? I don't know nothing about them. <sighs> Let's tackle this. We had a fella call in. I know he's sitting out here. He said if I didn't talk about electronics, he's going to be mad. Who was that? See that right there? He was over there beating, he's over there beating a walleye up. Don't ask me to get model specific, because I'm going to tell you go see Jim. This is an overview. How to set it up, what it means, how to use it. If you go on my boat, I live and die by that thing. If I'm jig fishing, if I'm trolling, anything like that, where I need to know what's underneath me, I'm glued to it. Don't talk to me, don't bother me. Just joking, but literally. I have my show and I catch those fish because of that unit. I'm so tired of hearing people say, that darn thing, it makes all these doo -doo 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 noises and it shows fish everywhere. I spent all this money and all, all I know is how deep it is and what the water temperature is. Wrong. Get your manual, read about it. Guys, if I went out and if I'm casting a weed bed for pike with Chad or whoever, we're visually fishing. We may be looking at a break, depth, whatever, but we're casting. Leave that up to the side scan units, whatever. Okay. But when you're underneath you, you got to believe in it. We go to Priest Lake. Did you guys see the Laker Conservation Show? Did you see that where we had the little kid and we had Mickey's grandpa who was 83 catch a fish and we're talking about don't kill him, don't wipe him out? That's a, that's a campaign we can't talk about because I'll get mad. There was a gal on there. She'd never drop shot fish. She'd fly fish. She'd never had a spinning pole in her hand. My objective that day was to get her a big lake trout. We fished all day long and they were sporadic. I had them tie one ounce drop shot weights on and we power fished. I got up on my spots and I ran. My graph set up properly. As soon as I'd start to see an arch come into the screen, I'd tell them to hang on. I'd slam the boat in reverse, back up till I saw it, and they'd drop. First time we did it, 23 pound fish. Catching one single fish underneath your boat. No lie, because you believe in your unit. You have to believe in it. I don't care if it's the most expensive one they make or not. If you're looking to buy a new one, what we're going to talk about here is going to help you make that decision. Let's get started. I've got to go to my notes on this because there's a lot of stuff in here. First biggest mistake that people make is you have a function that's a manual and an auto. How many people run on auto? Don't run on auto. Don't. No auto. Manual. I want it set to how I want it to be. How many have a function called fish ID? Okay. How many times have you been out and saw so many fish you got so frustrated they wouldn't buy nothing? <laughs> how many people have gone out trolling down riggers and said, man, we're dragging them right through the fish. Look at them. They're at 50 feet. There's a whole line of them there. That ever happened? I know it's happened to Ken because I was with him. <laughs> My grandfather, when we first got one, you know, and I didn't know back then, we'd take off from a spot. Boah, look at all them fish back there. Yeah, look at all them fish. There's like thousands of them back there. Understand what your graph is reading. How many people here believe that when the sonar pings, it's seeing the flesh of the fish? Who believes that? False. <coughs> the, the fish flesh is not dense enough to send an echo back. It goes right through it. Well, how does it work? Air. Works off of air. Now, if you're trolling a downrigger ball, it will pick up a downrigger ball because what? It's very dense. It's like a rock. Can't get through it. The bigger the fish, the bigger the swim batter, bladder, the bigger the mark. On Priest Lake, 
I can find you a fish, Ken was with me, you can hook the fish and I can tell you that that's a fish between 10, 12 pounds. I've got a color graph. I've learned to read it to where I can tell by the color that it's given me what's underneath me. Now I don't expect you to go out and do that tomorrow because it's just an absurd amount of time on the water. But if you have a color graph, and anybody that doesn't, please go spend the money. It will make your life so much more enjoyable on the water. Have you seen us go out and catch perch on the perch shows with kids? When I get into a school of perch, I know it instantly because the bottom is red. Perch come back to me as red. Big Lakers coming to me starting at about 10 pounds as a light lime green. 20 to 30 pounders, dark green. I know exactly what that is. Bass come back to me as basically black. Smaller swim bladder, excuse me. Kokanee, one of the hardest. I don't want to talk about catching kokanee because I use those lures for bait. I use kokanee colored lures to catch fish. But if you're diehard kokanee guys, which there are on here, I'm sure, kokanee are the hardest to see. Little tiny swim bladders. So how do I set it up? All right, Seth, you just told us what we're looking for in color. Great. How do we set it up? Who has a sensitivity setting on their graph? Okay, everybody should have one. When I started to fish in the ocean, we got our first radar, I learned the importance of sensitivity. When you set your radar up, you set it up to get a little salt and pepper. And what that means is, you don't want a nice clear screen, you want a little bit of trash on there, a little speckling. What it does is any little thing, could be pockets in the air, stuff in the air, whatever, it'll hit it. The graph does the same thing. When I set my graph up, and I'm no Picasso, so don't laugh at my art here. When I set my graph up, guys, first thing I do is I determine what level are we fishing at today. If we're lake or fishing, if we're walleye fishing, if we're focusing on perch, we're focusing in on the bottom. The first thing I do is I come in and I go to my zoom feature. Who has a zoom feature? That's a shark. Oh, whoops. Is that bad? Yeah. <laughs> is that bad? Is the boss here? No. Don't tell her. I'm really tired. No, I'm just dumb. Anyway. Let me try to get this off. Look at that. Oh. <laughs> so what we're going to work with here is the next two and a half hours are about this graph right here. You guys are going to have to pay me another 20 bucks to cover the board. <laughs> All I got to say is, who put the Sharpie up there, man? Help me out. Okay, let's get focused. Okay. We come in and we got our zoom feature, correct? Got our zoom feature. Do you guys understand how a zoom works? Well, Seth, it focuses in on the bottom or whatever zone I tell it to. Do you understand why that's important, though? How many of you looked at a graph and it said pixel resolution was 240 by 240 or 100 by 100 or 480 by 640 or whatever? Have you seen that? Okay. Here's what it means, guys. Those pixels work per inch. I'll have to kick him out here. Those pixels are per inch, guys. If you take a, let me pull out my cheat note here. The most common graph you're going to see is a 240, 240 pixels. And that's your height, 240 high. My graph is a 480 high by 640 wide. What I'm looking for is the height, the vertical pixels. If you take, and let's use a 240 here as an example to you. At 10 feet, one pixel is responsible for a half an inch of water. At 50 feet, one pixel is responsible for two and a half inches of water. At 100 feet, one little pixel is responsible for five inches of water. The first graph I ever had was a hummingbird wide eye. It cost me about 99 bucks. First one I ever bought, 100 vertical pixels. At 50 feet, it's six inches, one pixel. At 100 feet, it's 12 inches. It's a lot of responsibility. What that means is, 
you do not have a good picture coming back to you because one pixel is responsible for too big of an area. With a 480, you're roughly a third of a pixel responsible per inch. So as I get down, and we'll use this as an example again, if I get down to 100 feet, and I got a 240, which is what most of you guys probably have. If you've got a 240 at 100 feet, it's responsible for five inches. But if I zoom it in and I cover 30 feet, so if it's, it's now, if I'm down 100, guys, I zoomed it in so it's 70 here, 100 here. And you can move this zoom anywhere. If I'm trolling, I'll move it up to where my ball's at, <coughs> whatever. Now what it does is it takes this, focuses in right here at the 70 to 100, 30 feet, puts me at an inch and a half per pixel. It makes the pixels responsible for, more area, for less area, which draws a cleaner picture and allows you to see more fish. That's what your pixels mean. The big units that you see, 600 by 800, 600. That's drawing a very clean picture. So that's the importance of that. So when you zoom it in, when I get there, I know I'm walleye fishing or I'm laker fishing, I do it, I zoom it in. My, my graph's got a feature called bottom tracking color. What that does, it zooms it in, it turns it from like a blue background or a white background, whatever you choose, it, it turns it into a basically a reddish brown. That shows me the bottom is reddish brown. Now I'm zoomed into here, but I still have to crank my sensitivity up to focus on any little air bubbles, air pockets, swim bladders that are down there. So what I'll do is I'll turn my sensitivity up till I start to get some of this. Not a lot, just some of it. And you'll notice that when you zoom in, you know when you're running full screen, guys, and underneath your boat it's like this, all this jazz? What that is, if you've got wave action on the surface, you've got mixing that's occurring, putting air into the water. Maybe it's your boat going by and the prop turning. That's just upper level noise. It's very hard to read. When you zoom it in, this goes away. Because now you're focused right here. So now I tune my sensitivity up. I got just a little bit of, of peppering in there. Now what happens, how many of y'all want to wish to see arches? You all get arches, want to see arches? How do I see an arch? Why can't I see an arch? A lot of the arch issue comes because you're running on auto, which puts the fist symbols up there. By switching over to manual, it'll get your arches. If you go out, and we're sitting in the boat, and we're drop shotting, and we're laker fishing, and I say, fellas, there's a laker right there. It looks like that. Okay, that fish is right on the bottom in almost a nose down posture, feeding posture. If we're trolling for Lakers, and I go along and I say, fellas, whoo, there's one right there. If we're sitting there and one goes just like this and we're not moving at all, we're just sitting or we're anchored up, I say, fellas, whoo, there's one right there. Why are they three different? Nobody knows, right? Here's what happens. It's all predicated on movement of the boat. 50 to 200, 50 slash 200 kilohertz transducers. Who has them? Splitters. Who has straight 200 or 192? Okay. All right, guys. My boat has a 50 slash 200. A 50 has a cone like this, 36 degrees. My fit or my 200 has a cone like this, about 12 degrees, 8 degrees, it varies per model. Through hole, transom through hole has more. Do you know what wave frequencies mean and how they function and what they do for you? 200, guys, has a wavelength like this. Hence the narrower cone. A 50, <coughs> has a wavelength like that. Do you know why you use one or the other? No, because nobody reads their manual or it doesn't describe it well enough. Well, I'm gonna tell you right now. 200, they'll tell you is good to 400 feet. Don't believe it. 
Use the tool right. 200 for me is no longer used at 100 feet. 200 kilohertz is a tight, fast moving frequency. It cannot penetrate the water column fast. Or excuse me, deep. When it gets down to here, it starts breaking apart. Just like when you head out of town, you listen to the radio and you start getting out towards break, starts breaking up. Frequency's breaking up. This one right here, wider, slower, can go deep. When you're fishing deep right here. Most of the time I run the 200, this guy. But I will run this. If we're drop shotting, we're, we're jig fishing, and I'm in 100 feet of water or less, I'm always on 200. 200 gives you a cleaner picture. What happens here, you may get a mark like this, guys. And I'll say, there's one right there. Why are they all different? It's all about movement. As my boat moves this direction, and this fish is right here, and we move across it. As it sends it down, boom, it comes back. It draws a pixel. Bounces back down. Now the fish is in this area. Boom, draws another pixel. It's getting closer underneath the sonar as it travels over because of the cones like this. See how the distance gets shorter as it gets right underneath you? When the arch comes up like this at the topmost port, he is right underneath you. Remember how I told you about hitting one fish at a time lake trout? That's how you do it. But when, uh, step aside just a second, show that one again. This one? Yeah, okay. See, as it moves under, it's shooting out here. And as it gets closer underneath, it's getting shorter, which causes it to generate up the pixels as it draws it. And then as it goes out, it gets further away, which creates the drop. When you're just sitting stagnant and a fish swims underneath the boat, it just draws a straight line. A straight line. You won't see the arch. The misleading point that manufacturers do is when you go in and if you go in and see walleye, and he puts it on the demo mode, it draws these big, beautiful, perfect arches. That doesn't happen that often. Typically, you're going to get this, you're going to get a straight line, and you're still asking, what does this mean? What that means is that this fish never quite gets inside the cone. He's on the edge, so the frequency's breaking up, hitting him a little bit, hitting him a little bit, and it's drawing a broken arch. When I drop my, my stuff down, I want to be right on top of them, nice big thick arch, or a nice big thick line, because it may just be a broken line going through there. Make sense? Now you say, when do you want to use the 50? 